The next session is going to be split into two parts by a lunch break, as you know from the program. And I'm most pleased to be able to um, ask uh, President Derek Bach if he would please come to the podium. Thank you. I'm impressed by all this equipment in front of me. So anything happens up there, I can assure you uh, it's purely inadvertent. Uh, <laughs> unless there's some really interesting insights, in which case I'll take full credit. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to, to be here on a problem that uh, I think has afflicted me many times without my actually uh, being aware of it. So. Uh, uh, to get it out in the open and discuss it as a rare treat. Uh, I think I'm here because uh, David knew that I was involved many years ago in 1980, it was, with a, an early uh, uh, institutional conflict of interest problem. And he wanted me to say a little something about that episode, uh, how it looks uh, to me in retrospect. Uh, and then perhaps uh, reflect a little bit more uh, generally on the problem of institutional uh, conflicts, at least as, as I've experienced them. The episode in, in question involved a, a tenured uh, uh, professor of, uh, of biochemistry, Mark Potashny, uh, in 1980, uh, who came to me with a very simple proposal. Uh, he was uh, starting a company based on his own research. Uh, he had enough financial backing, but he wanted to give his own university, he said, a bite at the apple. He didn't tell me whether it was an apple of opportunity or <laughs> simply a descendant of its famous ancestor in the Garden of Eden, uh, but that came more and more clear to me as I went on. But this was, uh, that was certainly an unusual proposal for a professor at that time to make. Um, but I was not surprised because it was not the first unusual proposal that I'd had from Professor Potashny. Uh, just a year earlier, he had come to me with, uh, uh, I think, probably something that's never happened to a university president in, in, in the history of higher education in this country, and that, of course, is a very extreme statement. But he asked me whether I would personally guarantee a loan that he was taking out of $1 million to buy a Stradivarius violin. <laughs> and I agreed on the grounds that a $1 million, if you have been a university president, I'm sure many of you have, $1 million for a, a highly regarded uh, 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 professor of, of um, um, uh, biochemistry is really a very cheap price. And so I thought <laughs> this was just one of the other sacrifices that uh, I'm expected to make in this uh, position. Fortunately, Mark apparently paid it off, or at least uh, the creditors never caught up with me. But, but uh, it did accustom me to unusual propositions. Uh, and so I took his offer. He wanted to give us 10% of the stock for nothing. And so I took that to um, our in investment management uh, group. They, of course, were ecstatic. I mean, they were not used to getting large blocks of stock for nothing. And although the stock at that point was not worth anything, um, Potashny's reputation uh, made them salivate in Pavlovian fashion. And uh, so uh, they very much hoped that we would um, go ahead. When I talked about it with my staff, they were enthusiastic. Uh, they recognized, uh, as the investment people did not, that there were certain risks. Uh, Potashny might spend too much time on his company. Uh, graduate students might be exploited in order to uh, do company business rather than uh, their own research training. Uh, there might be excessive secrecy for financial reasons. Uh, but those risks would exist whether or not we invested in his company. Uh, and besides, the university had rules on secrecy, rules on the use of graduate students, rules on outside activities, and we could always uh, appoint a, 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 a distinguished oversight committee to ensure compliance. So we thought uh, that we had those risks well under control. Uh, but some elementary uh, principle of self preservation led me to 
discuss this as being a case of first impression uh, with the full faculty, um, and I did that. Uh, I would say there were lots of questions. Uh, there was, I think it's only fair to say, no visible outpouring of enthusiasm similar to what I had received from our investment people, um, but there was no great opposition either. Uh, there was a sort of uh, uneasy curiosity about the, uh, the meeting, but it didn't leave me feeling that this was doomed. But then the sort of thing happens that, that often happens to us in life that turns out to be uh, significant in changing our thinking. Uh, a professor by the name of Jeremy Knowles, a professor of, uh, of um, chemistry uh, from England, whom I uh, worked hard to recruit, uh, came to see me. Uh, he didn't offer any new arguments, but it was clear he very much hoped that we would not go ahead with this venture. And I knew Jeremy enough to know that beneath this uh, very thick layer of British banter uh, was someone who really cared a lot about values and ethical principles. And I could see in his eyes that he was really concerned, although he didn't e express it in terms of, 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 of arguments. That, uh, uh, but I knew his instincts were very much against it. And that moved me to think again, and then to talk again uh, at length with, with a, a comrade in arms who I have always, uh, always admired and always uh, appreciated as a friend, Jerry Wiesner, uh, who of course at MIT had had much more experience with these things. And I began to see problems with this type of investment that I, I was not sure we could deal with. Uh, there was, first of all, a potential for bias in promotion issues, salary, space of professors in whom we had some financial interest. And even if we could persuade ourselves that we had no uh, actual bias, there certainly might be a perception in the university that uh, uh, certainly every time a professor in whom we had financial interests got promoted or got a bigger office or had all sorts of things that they might have gotten anyway, people might begin to say, well, it's because the university is trying to make money off this particular professor. And that's a very serious matter, of course, because the integrity of those personnel decisions is really very important, indeed essential to a university. Uh, there was a problem that uh, the financial interests might uh, uh, cause us not to enforce our rules about secrecy and how much time was spent working on your company. After all, if he were spending a, a lot of time um, uh, trying to make his company succeed, uh, it exceeded the 20% limit that uh, Terry mentioned. Uh, after all, he was working in our interest now because we had a financial stake in his success. Well, once again, even if you didn't succumb to that, the sense that people might have that you might succumb to it uh, was itself harmful to the university. And then, of course, there might be divisiveness in the faculty. Uh, you couldn't probably, uh, you wouldn't want to invest in all of your uh, professor's ideas uh, and companies, uh, and therefore you'd have to pick some and to turn down others, and that might cause internal frictions that maybe uh, don't represent an ethical problem, but nonetheless uh, a practical problem that you had best avoid. And finally, I think a very real risk that if uh, we acquired stock in a professor's company that could easily be perceived around the university as an institutional endorsement of the idea of professors starting companies. And uh, that was, at least at that stage, uh, was not something that I felt very comfortable doing. So eventually, uh, I turned the proposal down. Um, and now when I look back on that, I, I of course, found that uh, uh, as usual, I was way behind the times. Um, my judgments have not been vindicated by history uh, and all of that because many universities are, have blocks of stock in the uh, companies founded by their professor. In fact, I would say not only do they have stock in, in the startups of their professors, but this is very widely considered to be a good thing. 
Uh, indeed, you not only have blocks of stock in your professors, but you set up incubators, uh, you actively search for investors. Uh, so far from worrying about uh, possibly uh, being seen to encourage commercial activity by your professors, uh, it seems to me encouraging pr such activity, encouraging startups, is a, now a mark of distinction uh, for which uh, I think people feel that uh, they get public approval. Uh, so, um, and I would have to say, as far as I know, uh, and I agree with Jonathan that there's perhaps too little empirical research, but there is a fair amount about what the effects of some of these financial practices have been. And I'm not aware, I, I don't follow it uh, enormously closely, but I try to keep up a little bit. I'm not aware of any hard evidence that, uh, that uh, uh, great harm has come to science by uh, startup companies. I, uh, uh, as far as I know, people, professors who st have startups continue to be productive and publishing papers and getting uh, that are peer-reviewed and get cited a lot, uh, and, uh, uh, and there isn't uh, much evidence of favoritism or the exploitation of graduate students. There may be scattered instances, but uh, I don't see that uh, this has become a big problem. Um, there are, of course, problems where human subjects are involved, and you had the famous Gelsinger case in, in Pennsylvania, but by and large, I would say, uh, taking financial interests in the work of your scientists is not uh, generally, uh, it hasn't been shown uh, to have serious deleterious effects on the quality or amount of science. So how do I feel about these investments now? I, I think it would all depend. Let me give you just two cases. I won't try to give you some easy to apply principle, but at least two cases that indicate my sort of ambivalence on the subject. Uh, there was set up in our medical school at, at much later point a venture capital firm to invest in faculty discussions. Uh, the, uh, uh, to faculty discoveries. Uh, the administration of the firm was uh, made completely separate from the Harvard administration. The money for the firm to invest in these discoveries was raised from outside investors, although Harvard had a small percentage of any profits made. Um, none of the investments could possibly be more than a tiny infinitesimal sum compared to the overall resources and endowment of the university. Uh, some of the money might be used for what people said was a very useful purpose, and that is to try to bridge the gap between a useful discovery and bringing it to a point where outside investors would be interested. So to some extent, you might be able to uh, allow technology transfer to occur that might not uh, without such a company. Uh, and it seemed to me the risk of, of bias or, or even perceived bias was negligible. I couldn't think of anyone in the Harvard administration who would even be aware of what the investments of this company were, uh, which professors were involved, and to my knowledge, even today, um, uh, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any any investments that, that, that anyone even knew about uh, in the administration. Now, it seems to me that at that point, you get something of a de minimis rule, and you also get a certain, rem the administration of the whole fund is separate enough from the administration that I'm hard pressed to say that there was a significant risk of the kind of dangers that bothered me in the, in the um, uh, the Potashny case. But then you'd look at a case like the famous Sarajan case at BU, uh, where some 30% of the BU endowment was invested in a particular uh, company, a sort of huge personal gamble by the president of the university to try to get a big uh, windfall for his endowment. Uh, under those conditions, of course, uh, everyone at the university and certainly everyone in the local media and many other people besides were aware of this investment. Uh, the stake of the university was very clear, very obvious, and very large. Uh, 
so there was an obvious risk that uh, scientists at Saragen who were on the faculty would get special treatment, uh, that any appointments or resources they deemed important to success would be likely to be given to them. Uh, if that wasn't true, in fact, it certainly was a logical inference to draw. And so, and if nothing else, unless I've forgotten uh, what I learned in this law school many, many years ago, uh, the investment by itself of that larger block of stock in a single company, let alone a totally unproven startup company, uh, was a violation of the prudent man rule. So on many grounds, it seems to me, uh, that uh, sort of uh, conflict of interest would be, uh, would be most unwise. So I think, I guess I come down to say, I think it all depends. Uh, you can, uh, uh, I've sort of tried to, to provide examples at either end of the spectrum and where the tipping point in the middle comes uh, would be very difficult to say. But I find it very hard to, uh, to make generalizations or establish you know, bright line principles for cases that seem to me uh, um, where the risk is so remote that one needn't really worry about it from places where the risk becomes much more tangible. Now, moving from that to institutional conflicts of interest generally, and not just the, the kind of financial uh, interests connected with research that uh, have occupied our, most of our attention until now, here I see a much, much bigger problem uh, than I used to imagine. Um, I think it is becoming more and more common for uh, universities to uh, get involved in enterprises uh, for which they uh, hope to make a profit in order to finance other parts of the university. Uh, and uh, these raise, it seems to me, many of the same uh, dangers that individual conflicts of interest have. Uh, for example, just to begin with one that's much closer to the, uh, or very close to the area of research, uh, there are universities, I gather, medical schools that have set up uh, drug testing uh, outfits in order to uh, uh, systematically test the new drugs of pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and these are run at a profit, which I guess goes to the medical school for its uh, general expenses. Uh, I find it very hard to distinguish that and the problems it raises from individual faculty members who are uh, getting money from uh, to test the products of, of companies from which, in which they have a financial interest. In both cases, there's a financial interest in pleasing the, the drug companies, uh, which conflicts with the duty to be entirely objective. And certainly there's a perceptual problem that such a conflict exists. Uh, I'm sure that the university officials involved in these drug testing operations are confident that uh, they would never be influenced in this way, just as all pro almost all professors who have conflicts of interest are confident that their professional judgment would uh, not be influenced. Uh, but um, we know that we can't rely on uh, that kind of self-confidence in individual cases. Uh, I don't think uh, we should uh, rely on it uh, in institutional cases either. But increasingly, as I say, uh, it, it begins to spread far beyond uh, research. Let me give you some examples of places within universities that, where you, you uh, 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 where in, in which many universities are making a profit to help their bottom line uh, in ways that uh, create a conflict with audiences that, uh, and uh, services of the university of an academic nature that may be corrupted by the conflict in question. We'll take executive education. Uh, business schools, uh, I think of a, one business school not far from here that makes literally tens of millions of dollars every year uh, from its executive uh, uh, programs, uh, which, uh, which corpora corporations send their, their uh, managers for courses of anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. Um, another, of course, very colorful example 
uh, of the same thing is um, intercollegiate athletics, uh, which is uh, uh, certainly, uh, if it doesn't profit the whole university, it's certainly in areas like football and basketball is used to finance the rest of the athletic program, which otherwise the university would have to pay for. Uh, take a small, humble, colorful example, alumni cruises, uh, from which profits are, are made, uh, where you take alumni to exotic corners of the world with professors on board who give lectures. Uh, patent licensing, we, uh, ooh, uh, <laughs> patent licensing is a, another area, uh, of course, closely related to, to research. Campuses abroad, uh, you, you start campuses and, and you, uh, you uh, in the case of NYU, for example, in Abu Dhabi, you get $50 million on top and then a, a, a share of the operating expenses. Uh, extension schools, most extension schools now are run on a for-profit basis. Online education, uh, there are indications and certainly there were a venture started at the uh, turn of the century where universities were allied with venture capitalists uh, to, uh, to run online education for, uh, for profit. Uh, and of course, there are even internal subsidies where as a law school dean, former dean, I'm acutely aware that many universities actually tax their law schools uh, in order to support other parts of the university. And, and you could say that gives them a financial interest in perhaps economizing in ways that may be compromising to the ideals of good legal education in order to get the surplus they need for other parts of the university. So in all of these cases, there's a conflict between the university's obligation to conduct all of its uh, academic activities at a high level of quality and its desire to make money uh, from a particular program. Now, some people might say, well, yes, but this is a university. Surely we can trust them to observe high standards and academic uh, values. But if you look at the record, um, and I won't go into some of these examples because my time is running out, but I think it's perfectly clear uh, that uh, you, the universities, like professors, cannot be implicitly trusted not to sacrifice academic values in the pursuit of profit. Um, in the 1920s, they ran a, a number of distinguished universities, ran correspondence courses. Uh, I won't go into the details, but by and large, um, they exploited the frailty of, uh, of those who, uh, uh, who signed up for them. Uh, because once you signed up within a short period of time, it was not refundable. Uh, they knew that uh, people who sign up for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, correspondence courses drop out in large numbers. Um, their major expense was paying graduate students to grade the exams and papers of these students. And of course, so if people dropped off, they were no longer an expense but you kept the, the, uh, the money that uh, they had paid for their tuition, and as a result, uh, a tidy profit was made off the operation uh, by exploiting the human frailty of, um, of the people who signed up and not to be able to persevere to, to complete the course. A much more colorful and more recent example uh, is once again intercollegiate athletics. We all know what is done there in, the, in pursuit of uh, of winning teams and higher gate receipts and television revenues. Uh, admission standards of athletes are um, at a greatly lower level. Uh, they often take uh, easier courses. Uh, they uh, have heavy practice demands uh, that demonstrably cause them to perform well below. It's not just that they come in with lower academic credentials, they perform well below their predicted uh, level, presumably because of the burdens of the athletic program. All this is done in behalf of, of uh, having winning teams and profitable teams. Uh, I would say patent licensing, if you really looked at it carefully, you'd see various uh, examples in patent licensing of overzealous enforcement uh, the overuse of, of exclusive licensing, uh, too much exclusive licensing of early stage inventions, uh, and uh, uh, much else. So does that mean that all 
the institutional conflicts that I talked about were wrong? Uh, no, I don't come to that uh, conclusion. Indeed, I think the profit motive is often uh, very useful in, in creating enormous uh, energy and ingenuity in lowering costs and improving, uh, in improving quality. And so where you have a really uh, competitive situation where you have a variety of suppliers and where the customers of the university's profit-making activities are able to make uh, discerning judgments. In other words, when markets behave more or less the way economists uh, would uh, present them in ideal form, uh, I think you can get the benefits of competition and uh, uh, with minimal uh, dangers of exploitation. And so I think in places like executive education that I mentioned uh, for companies or for the uh, officials of, uh, of government agencies, I assume that they know what they're getting uh, and the danger of exploitation is very low. I think the same is true of alumni cruises. I think probably maybe even for campuses overseas, you can uh, assume that Abu Dhabi uh, ought to know that it's getting something worth the price uh, and uh, can uh, uh, terminate the relationship if it isn't. But there are many, many cases that, of the ones that I've mentioned uh, in which the customers are vulnerable uh, as they were in correspondence courses. I worry very much about having online education uh, run for a profit. Uh, I think uh, uh, there's a clear economic danger that if it's run at a profit, you are going to try to attract as many students as you can with great lectures and wonderful visuals and, and uh, all sorts of things, but provide very little of the follow-up, which is so important to learning, of, of, of active discussion groups and personal uh, uh, attention from the instructor, uh, because uh, if you do that, uh, then all you have to do is to sign up a lot of people, and after a certain point, it's almost pure. A pure profit. So I see in that case and many other cases where universities are trying to make a profit, uh, a very um, real danger of exploitation in a way that really corrupts the values of the university in trying to do academic work at the very highest level of quality. So in conclusion, uh, to me at least, institutional conflicts turn out to be a much, much bigger, more pervasive problem than I imagined when I uh, was thinking about the case uh, I had with Mark Potashny's company. And I, I worry a lot that, uh, well, I would guess, for example, that uh, when David Korn writes that universities have not been very willing to discuss with the government the regulation of, uh, of institutional conflicts, part of the reason is that I think universities don't know where that conversation is going to lead. There is, are so many examples of potential conflicts of interest that the, and the money involved is so important to universities that the thought of opening that Pandora's box without knowing what ultimately uh, is going to happen uh, is very real and it, there will be institutional opposition to uh, really looking at the problem with the care it deserves. And I think that's something we all have to fight against because uh, uh, we can always hope somehow things will turn out for the best, uh, but uh, cases like intercollegiate athletics remind us that they don't always turn out for the best, uh, even in these wonderful institutions that we all love. And uh, that probably the best, uh, best way to do it is to begin having discussions like we're having today. Uh, and I think, uh, also make sure that we have discussions with our faculty about these, uh, these cases. Because in the end, after 50 years of uh, thinking about academic administration, I've come to the reluctant conclusion that much as I like uh, the people who uh, administer universities, I still believe that faculties, not all individual faculty members, but faculties as a whole, are the surest um, 
guarantee that we have of genuine concern for academic values and a genuine interest in seeing that those values are maintained. Uh, so that the more that we can bring our faculties into those discussions in a serious, structured way, uh, the better off we'll be. And this is a wonderful start to just such a process. Thank you. Uh -huh.